All right, in this video, I want to talk about what's called the Cantor set and uh, also talk a little bit about geometric series. So the Cantor set is really, to me, it was kind of uh, mind-blowing when I first saw it. And uh, it really made me start thinking uh, more deeply about what's going on with, you know, with math. You know, up till, I would say up till then, I still just saw it largely as symbol pushing. I knew something deeper was going on, right? I mean, if you open a, a graduate textbook or, uh, you know, there's there's clearly something going on. But I, um, to me, up to that point, it still just felt like, you know, memorize this formula, do this, do that. And uh, the Cantor set I thought was really cool. It sort of made me think about... Uh, made me think about numbers <laughs> and uh, uh, just some of the implications. So if you're bored and if you've never heard of this mathematician, his name was Cantor, definitely check him out. Um, he was a German mathematician. Did some really, really cool stuff. So anyway, the Cantor set. And uh, so, so you're probably saying, you know, why is this so mind-blowing? Um, so to construct this Cantor set, we'll start with the closed interval 0 to 1. So... I'm just going to draw it, you know, like a line. So there's 0 and there's 1. So that's the first step. Okay, so so that's our, or I should say that's our 0th step. We haven't done anything yet. So we've got this interval from 0 to 1. What we do is we start removing, uh, we remove the middle third of this interval. So at n equals 1, the first step, what we do is we remove the middle third. So this would go from 0 to 1 third. And then it would go from two thirds to one, right? So I've removed that middle that that middle one third. At the second step, we just basically keep repeating this procedure over and over and over and over and over infinitely many times. So what I do is now I look at each interval that's left and I remove again the middle third. So I'm going to get rid of the middle third and again the middle third. And from our other interval, I'll do the same thing. We'll get rid of the middle third and the middle third. Okay, so, and at n equals 3, we would do this again. Um, I would remove the middle third from each little interval. So, my intervals here have little wings on them. Okay, so notice, for example, when we do this, we're going to keep chopping this, we're going to keep doing this repeatedly, uh, over and over and over, as we'll let n goes to infinity. The points that remain the points that remain as n goes to infinity uh, make up make up the Cantor set. So notice, for exam example, if you think about the point, you know, located at, at you know one third of the way through the number line, that point's always going to stay there because you're going to keep removing the middle third, the middle third, the middle third. That 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 point that's sitting at one third is always going to be there. So that would be, for example, a point in the Cantor set. So, and again, just keep doing this over and over and over. The points that are left over are going to be the points that make up the Cantor set. Notice clearly there's going to be infinitely many of them. Okay, so there's going to be infinitely many of those points. <clears throat> I think you can hopefully convince yourself of that. So, let's talk about geometric series. Let's find, you know, if we think about this in terms of length, Let's find the total length removed by repeatedly deleting the middle third, the middle third of each interval. Okay, so let's find the total length here, and uh, I think this is the interesting part. So. You know, at the first step, what have we done? Um, if we think about the, if we think about the uh, the number of intervals removed, so I'm going to make a little chart. So the number of intervals removed. So I'm going to think about the number of intervals removed, and I'm going to think the, about the length of each interval. So we'll just see if we can't spot a little pattern here. n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3. We'll see if we can't convince ourselves of some little pattern. So, well, at the first step, we've clearly removed one interval, right? We removed the middle one, and it has a length of one-third. 
Okay, so at the next one, right, so now there's, there's, uh, we, we've got these two intervals, and from each, uh, each one of those two intervals, we remove a middle third. Okay, so now we've removed a total of two intervals, right? We remove the middle third and the middle third that was there previously. And the length of each one of those intervals, so I'm thinking about the length of that interval and the length of that interval. Again, we've removed two new intervals. Well, this original length was a third. We've removed a third of a third. So, well, we've removed two intervals of length one-ninth is what we've done. Let's repeat this again. Okay, so, you know, for example, if I think about what's the length of this interval, um, well, the length of this interval, again, well, it, now it's a third of a third of a third, which means we've removed an interval of length 1 over 27, and notice now we've removed 1, 2, 3, four of those intervals. At the next step, you can convince yourself of this, um, we're going to remove eight intervals total, right? Because we've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. From each one of those little pieces, we're going to remove an interval, so therefore we will have removed eight intervals. And again, uh, the length of it is going to be a, a third of one over 27. And I could simply write that as 1 over 3 to the 4th. Notice in general, at step, let's say, n equals i, how many intervals have we removed? Well, it's always bumping up by a multiple of 2. So it's going to be 2. Well, I don't think 2 to the power of i works. For example, 2 to the 3rd wouldn't be 4. If we just subtract 1 from that, that's going to give us the total number of intervals removed at the ith step. Notice um, at n equals 2, for example, we have 1 over 3 squared. At n equals 3, we have 1 over 3 cubed. So the length of the interval will be 1 over 3 to the i power. Okay, so that's how much, that's the number of intervals removed, and that's the length of each interval at the ith step. Well, so what we would need to do to find the total length removed, find to, so let's see, the total length removed, well, we just have to add them up. So I'm going to write this in summation notation. Okay, so we'll start this at n equals 1. And the formula we're going to use, again, so instead of i's, now I'm using n's, so whatever. Um, we'll have 2 to the n minus 1 power times 1 over 3 to the n. And again, notice if we plug in n equals 1, we'll get 2 to the 0, which is 1. If we plug in n equals 1, we'll get a third. So it says, hey, we've removed one interval of length 1 third, which is what we concluded. If we plug in, for example, n equals 2, we'll get 2 to the first. So it says we've removed two intervals of length 1 over 3 squared, or two intervals of length 1 ninth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it looks like uh, my, my formula here is correct. Now, notice this is simply a geometric series. This is just a geometric series, and I'm going to rewrite this a little bit. So I could write 2 to the n minus 1 as 2 to the n times 2 to the negative first power, right? If we have like bases, we just add the exponents, so that would give that right back to me, times 1 over 3 to the n. So 2 to the negative first, that's the same thing as 1 half. And then I've got 2 to the n over 3 to the n, which I'm going to write as 2 over 3 raised to the n power. So not only is this a geometric series, this is a convergent geometric series. So this is a convergent geometric series. Remember the, the number that's being raised to the power has to be strictly in between negative 1 and positive 1, which it is, again, for it to converge. And if it is convergent, remember the formula, the way I think about it is, it's the first term you get over 1 minus the, the r value, the ratio, the number being raised to the power. So again, if you forgot about geometric series, I, again, have videos on those. So in this case, the first term, 
Well, if we plug in n equals 1, well, that's what we did up here, right? We plugged in n equals 1. We're left with 1 third. And then we do 1 minus the r value, the ratio. In this case, the thing that we're multiplying by each time, if we expand this out, would be 2 thirds, 2 thirds, 2 thirds. So we'll get 1 minus 2 thirds. Well, hey, that's just 1 third over. Well, 1 minus 2 thirds is 1 third. And that gives us the value of 1. So this is the thing to me that was kind of mind-blowing, right? Um, it made me think about rational numbers and irrational numbers and, and, and infinity and points and uh, lots of things. So, so again, notice the interesting thing. There's going to be infinitely many points left over, right? Each time we, we make a new, each time we do this step one more time, we're creating, the endpoints of an interval are always going to stay, right? That point's always going to be there, that point's always going to be there, that point's going to be there, that point's going to be there. You know, for example, at the, at the next iteration, well, they're still sitting right there. They're still sitting right there. But now we've created some new ones as well, some new points, whoops, some new points that are going to be there. So there's infinitely many points left over, right? There's still infinitely many points in this Cantor set. But by removing these middle thirds repeatedly, we actually remove a total length of 1. And again, right, if you start at the very beginning, it's an interval from 0 to 1. That has length 1. So this is the thing that's very, feels kind of strange, right? If you remove something of length 1, it feels like you've gotten rid of everything, right? You should have gotten rid of every single thing. But in fact, we haven't. And not only are we not left with finitely many points, we're left with infinitely many points. So, I don't know. This, uh, this still kind of, uh, I would say it doesn't blow my mind as much now because I've had a chance to, to, st to study some of these things uh, a bit more. But at the time, this was very, uh, it was problems like this that started getting me interested in just kind of the very mathy part of mathematics. Um, uh, so, so things that I had never kind of, it was making me start thinking about sort of thoughts and concepts that I never had before in regards to mathematics. And when you start doing that, that's when, um, I think that's when it gets interesting. So, all right, so I hope the uh, Cantor set has has interested you. This is actually an example of a fractal, right? Can you, if you can imagine, kind of zooming in on an interval after you keep chopping it up, it's actually going to be it's going to look like uh, all the other iterations. If you keep zooming in, it's going to keep repeating and repeating and looking like itself. So this is actually an example an example of a fractal. There's a, a two dimensional analog that's called Sierpinski's carpet, and to get Sierpinski's carpet. You just start with a, a square, you know, again, suppose it has length 1 and, and width 1. It really doesn't matter that, that. But what we do now is uh, we remove the middle portion of it. So we get rid of the middle po portion at the first step. And then if, what we do, you kind of have, you know, if you think about little squares, you've kind of got, you know, almost sort of like eight little squares left over. So we're going to, uh, for Sierpinski's carpet, you get rid of the, you start off by getting rid of the, the middle square. And then for each square left over, you do the same thing. You now remove the, the very middle portion of each one of those. So that would be the second iteration. A funny story about Patrick, I don't know if I should say this because uh, it's embarrassing. I have no tattoos. I thought about getting one, and a long time ago... Sarampinsky's carpet for a while was the uh, the leading uh, the leading tattoo. I I never did it. Um, um, so if you're out there and, and uh, want to impress Patrick, go get a tattoo of Sarampinsky's carpet. Of course, you can't get the final thing, um, but you could get an iteration. So again, now if you look at each square, you do the same thing. At the next step, you would remove kind of all the little squares around it. And you keep this process up over and over and over and over for all the little squares, and you get uh, what's known as Sierpinski's carpet. And you can do something very similar and show that there's going to be infinitely many points left over in Sierpinski's carpet. I, I'm sure I'm butchering that name. Um, you can show that there's infinitely many points left over, but you can show that the area removed by deleting 
uh, these, these middle portions, again, is equal to 1. So it's just a two-dimensional analog to the Cantor set. So, again, if you're bored, um, check out the Cantor set. Sets turn out to be something super fundamental and super, super important in higher mathematics. A lot of, of well, I mean, a lot of higher mathematics is based on sets and set theory. Um, it turns out to be this sort of very primitive stuff, but it turns out to be super duper important, in fact. So, again, the Cantor set and Sarampinsky's carpets kind of give us some, uh, some interesting examples to think about.